Roberts and Juan Ramirez. And to the 1300 of you uh, for taking time to register and join us online today. And I'm gonna ask that um, Shiva or our tech team, if you can share um, some accessibility information in the chat. So just a note uh, on accessibility to access cart uh, captions for our event, please visit our stream text event site and the URL for that is https colon forward slash forward slash www.wordshare.com forward slash player forward slash EFL. The link was also sent out to everyone uh, who registered via the Eventbrite and it is included in the Critical Resistance YouTube page notes as well. Throughout this event, please use the Q&A feature. I just realized my slide skipped. Sorry about that, y'all. Please use the Q&A feature to raise any accessibility issues so that our tech team can support. And you can also use the Q&A feature to share any resources that you want us to share with the broader community. And if you share about your experience using social media at all, please make sure to use the hashtag lessons in liberation. All right, here we go, y'all. So we wanna make sure that before we begin this very important conversation, we wanna acknowledge the stolen, occupied, unceded, native land that each of us are joining this call from. And we ask that you take a moment to acknowledge the indigenous name of the land that you are joining from. And if you do not know uh, what the indigenous land is that you're on, there's actually an app that you can get called Native Land and it will help you to locate the name of indigenous land anywhere you go. We know that our work must always go beyond just words and that we must act in solidarity with all First Nations who are working to protect their land and their people. And so in collaboration with this land acknowledgement, we ask that you also join us in committing to take action and to be in solidarity with all Native people wherever you are. So we can support rematriation and indigenous organizing in our community locally with a donation, or we can also give to collectives like the Segorite Land Trust uh, to support their work to return indigenous land to indigenous people. And I'm gonna read the URL for folks as well. It's HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash S-O-G-O-R-E-A-T-E slash L-A-N-D-T-R-U-S-T dot O-R-G forward slash D-O-N-A-T-E forward slash. Erica and I and the rest of our organizing family um, also want to take a moment to honor a very important person who is no longer here in physical form to see this project in print, but who was so instrumental. On July 4th, 2021, our beloved Thomas Nkondo Nikundiwe transitioned from this world partner, father, brother, son, friend. Thomas was truly our North, South, East and West. And as our community mourns, we hold close the gifts of his words, his deeds and relationships that remain in our hearts and practices. And as we lift up Thomas's values, our offering here is to keep close to the deeply human ways of being with and caring for each other that were passed on to Thomas, embodied and evolved into legacy. When gearing up for the Free Minds, Free People Conference earlier this year, I was blessed to co-facilitate a grounding activity with him where he said, there is a real opportunity in getting to practice what it is that we're trying to do in the world. 
we have certain values and ways of being and dreams for the world, our communities, our families, and we have a chance to practice that with folks. And if we don't, then it's just the last opportunity for us to get better at what we're trying to do out in the world. How Thomas spoke and moved was a constant source of liberatory learning. We have endless gratitude for these lessons and we hold with this wider community and family the extraordinary gift to teach, organize, love and take care of each other as we live with Thomas's legacy. And so tonight in honor of our beloved T, please share at least one value or dream or way of being that you're trying to practice with folks in the world. And if you hover your camera over the QR code, you'll be able to access the uh, Padlet, the community Padlet. And Shiva will also be sharing um, the link in the chat. So I'm gonna go ahead and play a short song by Soul Development called Source of Light because that's truly what Thomas was, was a source of light. And we're gonna take a few minutes to just honor him in this moment by committing uh, to either a dream or a way of being or a value that you wanna practice. I feel the darkness all around me I feel like my inner light is just drowning But I give thanks to God that this light has found me So that the darkness of is still far from around me Cause even in the tunnel man, you still see the light And in the toughest struggle man, you still have to fight And when them do you wrong man, you still treat them right Despite the fact that they can't see the light See I do this for my children who were products of condition Until the day they realize they products of God's vision one who watched they pop a cook product up in the kitchen So when the system came to get them Took the family and split them I mean, I do this for the students who find it hard to dream But I'm also here to tell them it ain't as hard as it seems Cause in the darkest hour the stars are beautiful things If you follow closely enough well. It can be a dark world sometimes Don't be afraid to be a source of light It can be Never be afraid for you to let your light shine You were sent to use your talents as blessings to mankind Even in the darkest hour your purpose is still divine And can't nobody take it from you, your purpose has been a sign And a force on earth as great as a person pushing the rise The truth can free your mind even if they fear and you lies And it was hard to find the truth when you live in a sea of lies But if you couldn't see the light you still feel it if you were blind So in the time I hope these rhymes unlock your mind And maybe they can help you find your getaway you know that what you reap is what you sow that you believe tomorrow comes your better day. Thank you so much, y'all. Um, I'm looking at the um, at what folks wrote already in the Padlet. If you could just take a moment to just look at some of the values and ways of being that folks want to practice with others, it's hella inspiring. And I know that if Thomas <laughs> could see that all of this was inspired by his legacy in this moment, I know he would be so, so, so honored. And he would say, that's all y'all. It ain't even about him. It's all y'all. It's about us and our liberation. So thank you for honoring him in this moment. We love you, T. This is because of you. I'm going to pass it over to my comrade and sister in struggle, Dr. Erica Miners. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you, Fari. Um, thank you, just gratitude and love to you and for Thomas and this vibrant community. Um, my name is Erica Miners. Um, I'm a member of Critical Resistance and the Education for Liberation Network and many other powerful and joyous formations. I'm a white person with 
orangey blonde tinged hair, eyeglasses, and a black t-shirt um, under a button-up shirt with cranes on it. Um, I'm a teacher, a writer, and an organizer. And today, surrounded by the energy of formative educators such as Thomas and Bob Moses and Grace Lee Boggs and Marilyn Buck, we are gathering to celebrate the release of Lessons in Liberation, a multimedia toolkit that documents how teachers, young people, organizers, and communities are building and practicing abolition in their schools and neighborhoods. By abolition, as the Lessons in Liberation Toolkit shares, we center the long struggle to build stronger and safer communities without relying on prisons and policing and a host of other carceral or punitive practices and institutions. With examples and analysis of grassroots campaigns, first person narratives about curricular projects, visual cultures, uh, descriptions about restorative healing and transformative justice practices in classrooms and in communities. Our aim with this toolkit is both to proliferate dialogue and practice and also to elevate and to network the politically urgent work that is in process in our schools and in our neighborhoods. And we know that Lessons in Liberation is only a small slice of the amazing work unfolding right now. This toolkit is the product of years of collaboration between the Education for Liberation Network and Critical Resistance with multiple other affiliated organizations, including How All Our Lives Link Together, Link All Together, or HALA, the Urban Peace Movement, the Underground Scholars, the People's Education Movement, Teachers for Social Justice, Project What, the Black Organizing Project, and other networks. Beyond this beautiful toolkit from AK Press, we're also developing an accompanying Lessons in Liberation website and discussion guide, which will be coming soon. Of course, while we celebrate the release of Lessons in Liberation and all the labor that it represents, um, we want to lift up the tremendous anti-racist and anti-oppressive anti organizing and resilience of educators, including classroom teachers, para-educators, community educators, parents, aunties, uncles and aunties, siblings, organizers, and so much more. While we recognize this labor now during the aftermath of a rebellion and amidst multiple pandemics, these folks have been creating spaces for liberatory learning for the long haul. We know that many of, with us today um, are involved in active abolitionist campaigns. Every day I'm learning about new work that's unfolding. It's, um, it's really vibrant and exciting. Defund police work, for example. So we're encouraging you to use the Q&A and also the um, chat function to share whatever resources, campaign information, URLs for organizations, reports, union actions, posters or flyers, um, or via Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook with the hashtag Lessons in Liberation. So today we're diving in um, with comrades Edgar Ernesto Ibera Gutierrez, Chrissy A.Z. Hernandez, Miriam Caba, and Lisa Kelly to explore what it means to be returning back to schools in this political moment. What productive and other tensions arise when building abolition inside and outside of formal pre-K-12 or kindergarten to grade 12 teaching and learning contexts. And we're also gonna be sharing key tools, practices, resources, campaigns, and struggles with these fabulous folks. Um, but before we move to our discussion, we just wanna open with a short, very short performance from our uh, fabulous New York com Hala comrades. And um, I, think, I think Shiva's gonna cue that up for us. Peace, Lessons on Liberation. Welcome to our launch off event. Um, shout out to our panelists, a esteemed group of community and national leaders. Shout out to our moderators. Shout out to all of you for being present. We are here. 
share the event, repost the live recording once it's there in your inbox. Make sure you tell a friend to tell a friend. We're talking about education. We're talking about prison abolition. Uh, We're talking about radical love because it took years to get this project to this place that we are here today to even have this conversation. Shout out to my co-organizers um, who help organize Google Docs, Zoom meetings, webinars, um, retreats, and outreach to c- create this toolkit so that we can be able to, to pull all of these lessons together. Um, I'm an I'm a organizer. My name is Corey Green. I'm an organizer with How Our Lives Link All Together. I'm calling in live from New York, straight from the workout late night after thousand hours of zooms um but i wanted to get my mind body and spirit and particularly into warrior spirit um but i also want to zoom in and give some spirit um to our first event and just be a part of um this wonderful energy that we are about to create for today Uh, we're talking about prison abolition um we wanted to really introduce a poem um that speaks to the spirit of fighting prison abolition even though we ain't really talking about prison abolition in the poem that much. And this poem is called, This is for Our Ancestors. Because we believe that the system of prison abolition is an attack to our spirit. We believe that policy has no spirit, laws have no spirit. We believe that a lot of of our community members internalize the white man's practices, the white man's culture, the white man's religion, and um, the the white man's way of life. Um, that become a lot of our cultural practices of responses to love and to disagreement that become a lot of our individual psychologies and 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 behaviors um and it'd be hard for us to get to our spirit it'd be hard for us to have our ancestors with us in those moments so this poem right here this is for our ancestors is to remind us in the fight against prison industrial complex and complex and from a stance of prison abolition we need our ancestors we need a practice of spirit and ancestors we need our ancestors to be present with us all the time and we hope that they can be present with us today this is for our ancestors particularly the ones that stand with us and plan with us we talking about a pedagogy of patience They still waiting for your transformation and for us to heal from all the still blazing and generation after generation of living out the plantation. This is for our ancestors, particularly the ones that kill, get killed for us, sacrifice and build for us. We talking about indigeneity without no regulation. Culture is our education. Emotional communication, vulnerability is what we embrace, and this is for our ancestors, particularly the ones that love you when they don't got to, but love you because they got you. This is for our ancestors, particularly the ones that stand with us and plan with us. We talking about a pedagogy of patience. They still waiting for your transformation. And for you to heal from all the still blazing and generation after generation of living out the plantation, that was for our ancestors. Peace. Holla. All right. So we're thankful for our our holla comrades um, who have been with us since the beginning of this project and who have worked tirelessly to organize alongside us as formerly incarcerated youth and adults um, doing this work, right? So I want to um, move us and get us ready for our conversation today, tonight, this evening. Um, And I'm so excited to introduce our panelists. So first I wanna introduce Miriam Kaba, who is an organizer, educator, and curator who is active in movements for racial, gender, and transformative justice. She's the founder and director of Project Nia, an abolitionist organization with a vision to end youth incarceration. I also wanna introduce Chrissy A.Z. Hernandez, who has done hella work 
to make this project happen um, as our managing editor of Lessons in Liberation. Uh, she's a writer, an organizer, an educator from Salinas, California, a former teaching artist um, who is now an assistant professor of service learning and social action at the California State University Monterey Bay. Also want to introduce Lisa Kelly, who is an Afro-Latina runner and rugby player from Sacramento, California, a 10-year teaching veteran, and she's currently teaching at Met West High School in Oakland, uh, teaching English and history from an abolitionist and ethnic studies perspective and framework while supporting students and pursuing their passions through community internships. And lastly, I wanna introduce Edgar Ernesto Ibarra Gutierrez, who's a Chicano indigenous activist from Watsonville, California. Afro Latina program and leadership coordinator, California, a At two year Lisa. teaching program. I'm hearing some feedback right now. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, yeah, he's a program and leadership coordinator at MILFA. While experiencing the S2PP and incarceration, Edgar is now focused on ending mass incarceration and building community and people power through a healing and cultural lens. Welcome to our panelists. I'm gonna ask that they please show, um, those of you who want to show your video can show your video. And we're actually gonna start off with the first question, which I'm excited about. And the order of um, speakers is gonna be Chrissy first, then Edgar, Lisa, and Miriam, just so that you're prepared to just fall in once uh, the speaker before you um, finishes speaking. So y'all, it is September, 2021. And for those attached in some way to education, we're all either getting ready to go back or we're already back, whatever that even means, right? So the question to y'all is, why do we even need to be talking about and doing abolition work now? So I'm gonna go ahead and start with Chrissy. Hello everyone, um, this is Chrissy speaking. My pronouns are she and they. I'm wearing a black and gray flannel. I have white skin and short black curly hair. I am wearing glasses with brown speckled frames um, and earrings that are shaped like chairs. <clears throat> I am um, on, currently on the unceded land of the Ohlone Costanoan Esalen Nation. And I would like to thank you all um, and including the educators who are taking the time to be here uh, after a long day at school so early in the year. Um, I also just wanted to say that um, I see a bunch of our contributors um, to the toolkit in the attendees list. So welcome and just so excited to celebrate you all and all of our collective work today. Um, and then finally, I feel so honored and humbled y'all to be here with these incredible panelists. Um, so just thank you and, and feeling really excited and trying to make the nerves turn into excitement. Um, so I'm going to first speak about what led to this project, Lessons in Liberation. Um, so the now of this project. Um, all right, so the now of this project. So five years ago, the Education for Liberation Network and Critical Resistance came together to break down silos between uh, prison industrial complex abolitionist organizing and education um, through a series of public dialogues and convenings out of which came Lessons in Liberation. The goals of this project included bringing attention to abolitionist organizing in and around school spaces that have taken place and are taking place nationally. Um, two, to create a toolkit for educators for all, um, of all types to have access to the urgent, practical, and thoughtful practices of PIC abolition. And finally, to create an accessible toolkit that can be taken up by students, teachers, and community organizers. The urgency and necessity of a collection like this has persisted, even though the terrain has changed with the previous administration, right, of the last five years, the previous administration, the pandemics, uprisings against the state-sanctioned murder of Black people, 
the increased awareness and popularizing of the term abolition, and so much more, all of which have had profound impacts on uh, pre-K through 12 schools. Our hope and intention is that this toolkit is not treated as a ready-made map or a plug and play curriculum, but that it offers touchstones for deep reflection and seeds for organizing um, that are particular and specific to our different locations and the needs of the communities in which we live. So in this particular moment, um, one aspect of the terrain are the attacks on, and this is the one aspect I'll speak briefly to, are the attacks on what is being called critical race theory, um, which we know is really an attack on discussions, uh, let alone organizing around issues of race, racism, and other systems of oppression. I think in periods um, of this kind of targeting, it's even more important to have clarity about the visions of education of community that we're striving for. Um, the right has been consistently attempting to characterize this work as fundamentally destructive and about tearing things down when we know that abolition um, and ethnic studies and organizing against oppression is fundamentally invested, invested in an affirmative vision of the world. The collective work that has been poured and continued to be poured into Lessons in Liberation, um, into the publication, into the website, um, into these events, has been an example for me of uh, part of that affirmative vision. Um, it feel, I feel like I have to speak to some of that um, because that collective work um, has been so nourishing. We've built relationships, uh, we've mourned, we've laughed, we supported one another and organized through uh, together throughout messy and difficult times. We've held each other accountable with love and respect. And we've consistently had conversations about how we can move differently, um, how we can challenge a culture of taking, of extraction, of individualism, and how we can practice something different with one another. Um, and I think in this context in which everything feels um, often so bleak and so overwhelming, I think the affirmative vision of abolition is one of rigorous and practical hope that is invested in a culture of care, safety, and freedom um, that looks different in different places, but it's a vision that can guide us now. Thanks. We'll go ahead and pass it to Edgar now. Hey y'all, Piyali, Kuali Tlayowa. Buenas tardes, my name is Edgar Ibarra. Um, I'm a light, light brown, brown, Chicano indigenous man. I've got a short buzz cut, kind of like a fade going on right now. Rimmed, black rimmed, Ray-Ban glasses. Um, I'm currently in um, uh, Salina, uh, Esalen, Costa Nolan territory, uh, wishing them and their descendants, wherever they may be at, all the best and, and always wanting to sit sit and stand side by side of them and, and their for fight to reclaiming their land as well. And I uh, just really wanted to just start off, but it's an honor and a pleasure to be here in front of y'all. It's uh, it's always it, like being a, alongside all these amazing panelists and what they've done, their trajectory, their work, everything. It's, it's like an honor and I can only show up in the best way, you know, and that's with uh, my ancestors, uh, with uh, the spirit of my mother, the spirit of my father, and my, my ancestors in that way. And I just share what I know and the little bit of experiences that I know, which is not much, um, formerly incarcerated man who was doing his best, you know, just trying to get back to the community and, and change a lot of the things they, that I did in the past. But uh, and, and answering the question, I think, I was, I've been thinking about this a lot. Why do we need to be do, doing, continue to talk about abolition and, and actually doing it in, in our communities, in the schools? and um, I think one of the biggest things is right now we're in, in a critical moment during like so COVID-19, uh, everything that's happening from last year, from the uprisings, uh, it has really shined a light on what's happening in our communities. The, you know, the, the obvious like disproportionate realities of, of wealth income disparities and everything that's happening that like folks are really struggling. And um, that just shines a light of like, again, what's happening and, and, and when it needs to take place but also really having to, for myself, having to really uh, focus hyper, like on, on a low, 
focus locally on like hyper focus locally on what we need to be doing as far as challenging the system to be there at the school system, uh, the city council, the county, and really pushing for uh, this conversation to be had. A lot of folks shine away from having this conversation around abolition. And again, we, we continue to hear this narrative throughout throughout the country about like all oh, you know critical race theory and just all these different things that folks how they however they want to paint it. But again, it's we need to be courageous in having these conversations to bring them to light and continue to talk about them. I think most importantly, especially with this, you know, what's going on at the national level and at the world level that, you know, we're going to have troops coming back home and uh, those troops are going to need work. And potentially we're going to see a lot of more uh, correctional officers, more police officers. And how do we change, challenge that narrative? How do we challenge that issue? How do we provide jobs that don't, uh, or, or opportunities for these folks who are coming back? So actually they can, fall in line and help our communities in, in a way that doesn't incarcerate, doesn't punish in, in that sense, which those are going to be the jobs lining up. So really thinking about that and having to, again, have those conversations, not just at, within the school settings, but within our families, within our cousins, our tias, our grandmas, abuelitas, having everybody really recognize that this abolition is mind frame, thought process, uh, way of life needs to be embraced. And, uh, but also really thinking of how we show up for one another thinking of the, like the cross-cultural solidarity and healing that needs to take place within amongst a lot of the movement spaces. So just thinking of what I can do and how I can support others, but also thinking of all movement humility. You know, uh, I know there's a lot of things taking place. A lot of folks know a lot of things and uh, how do we just sh show up in our humble way and support one another and think and just at the end of the day, knowing that, hey, you know, one of my uncles always says, I don't know nothing, you know, I don't know nothing and just, just show up and be able to, willing to support, stand uh, side by side, sometimes a little bit behind, sometimes a little bit in the front, but whatever way it is at that moment that we're uh, called to to stand, and just be able to show up like that for one another. I'll say that much, palabra. Thank you so much, Edgar. I'm gonna pass it to Lisa. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon from where I am on unceded Ohlone territory in the Bay Area in Oakland, California. Um, I am a brown skinned woman with shoulder length curly hair, wearing big gold um, hoops with the Oakland tree in it and makeup and an orange top. And um, to answer this question of why abolition now, I mean, my answer is a little short, but also expand on it. It's because we're not yet free. So um, my, I'm not free, my people are not free, and everyone living in the empire of the United States is not free. So we need to keep fighting for abolition until we achieve liberation and freedom for all. Um, to expand on that, I wanna quote um, my sisters, Barima and Mari Lin, who wrote on page 170 of the incredible toolkit book in their article, Why Spiritual Revival Matters, they wrote that our core belief is that education should always be about liberation from all forms of oppression. And as a school teacher, as someone who's working in the school system, I know that the main mechanism for perpetuating the status quo, for perpetuating the oppression that we all live under is the school system. That's where we learn it. That's where it's in, well, it's not the only place we know learn it, but that's one of the places that we learn it. It's one of the places where it's enforced and one of the, the places where the status quo is perpetuated. So if I'm going to be an abolitionist educator, an anti-racist educator, an educator who believes in the liberation of my people, then I need to be teaching that in the classroom. I need to be actively using an abolitionist framework in my practice. And I need to be considering every decision and move that I make and understanding, am I moving towards the humanization of my students? Am I moving towards the liberation of my students? And everyone, my colleagues and myself. And it's exhausting work to do that, to constantly question and interrogate myself and interrogate what we're doing. And I'm not always gonna be able to answer yes to that question because I am in the oppressive schooling system. But if I'm not willing to do that hard work and I'm not willing to make mistakes and I'm not willing to try, then I personally believe I shouldn't be in education. I should ask myself, why am I teaching if I'm not willing to teach for the liberation of my students? So for me, the reason we need to keep talking about abolition is because we are not yet free. Thank you, Lisa. And we will pass it to Miriam. 
Hello, everyone. Good evening. Um, I am Miriam Kaba, and um, I use she, her pronouns. Um, I am a Black person. The image on the screen is a photograph. Um, I have a head covering. I'm wearing a brown and burgundy jacket-ish thing and some brown piece earrings. Um, I want to thank all the organizers of the event, all the support people. I want to thank everyone who contributed to this really, truly wonderful toolkit, which is such an amazing and useful resource for educators. Um, I hope you'll indulge me for a few minutes because I think that this question, I've been thinking about it, and I think it deserves a fulsome response. So this summer at Project NIA, we offered a virtual abolitionist organizing institute for um, over 60 young people between the ages of 16 to 24. And it's the second summer that we've done this kind of virtual institute. Um, and what that experience reinforced for me is that we should really always be talking about prison industrial complex or PIC abolition because it's an emancipatory political vision, because it's an analytic framework for understanding structural oppressions, and because it's a viable and useful organizing strategy, right? We know that abolition is a project of making things and of constantly iterating ideas and also of dreaming. We need all those things in education, right? We need to be making new things. We need to be constantly iterating ideas. We need to be dreaming. We need an emancipatory political vision for education. But let me be more concrete, because I'm a concrete person, and I like to have examples. So abolition is a collective project, right? PIC abolitionists know that we cannot be lone rangers. So what does that mean under our current conditions? And just about a few days ago, my friend, the brilliant abolitionist educator and organizer, Laura McTie, shared on Facebook how she opened her class with her college students recently. And I wanna share her words with you all tonight because to me, they truly encapsulate abolitionist teaching and practice. So I'm gonna read um, Laura's words. I think that um, I sent them in advance to our interpreters, so hopefully um, it'll be easier to follow along. And don't worry, when I'm done with reading these words, I will make sure that I include them in the chat so that everybody can have them as well. So here's how Laura starts. Meeting my 49 gender and religion students today impressed upon me that we are in the midst of a disaster. And also what it means to say that and work from that truth. If I've learned anything from my decade plus of being in community in New Orleans, it's that we make the conditions of our survival and thriving together because our world is and has long been divided into, and here she quotes Ruth Wilson Gilmore, those who have suffered organized abandonment and those who labor in the area of organized violence to keep steady the otherwise explosive conditions that people are living through, unquote. Those of us who know this have a responsibility to teach it to model it, to make the mutual aid that doesn't just get us through, but gets us free. That for me, changes what we teach and how we teach. And I'm happy to offer support to any faculty colleagues who are struggling to imagine otherwise right now. Below is a rough recreation of my opening remarks from today, which give you a sense of how I'm trying to turn what I've learned about mutual aid, disaster relief into pedagogy for these times. Thank you for all that you are doing 
and all that you are learning. And thank you, most especially, for the ways you're making and taking care. Love and respect. So this is what Laura said to her class. Welcome to gender and religion. Stuff is scary and uncertain right now. And while we may all be weathering the same storm, we're doing so under vastly different conditions. Many of you are excited to be back face to face or are starting college for the first time. I also know that some of you are primary providers for your family. So being face to face has different burden for you. And some of you may also have no family to quarantine with should you be exposed to COVID or we have to go remote. This is an opportunity to be the very best to each other that we can. That has everything to do with gender and religion. Gender and religion are both about doing. So we're going to learn by doing in this class. This is not a lecture course, it's a practice course. Let me explain what that means. We will have four units, tools, space, stories, community. Each one will be three weeks long. They're cumulative and also independent. So if we, are, if we suddenly have to go remote, we'll have an easier time staying on track. And we'll do that together. Each unit will open with an introduction, followed by a practice session. Then we'll work with primary sources, followed by another practice session. Then we'll close out with presentations from you. To make this class run, we'll be dividing into small groups, pods of six. You'll work together every Thursday and we'll complete many projects each unit and a final project at the semester's end. Each of these assignments will be self-directed because I'm committed to building a classroom with you in which we are all both teachers and students. We'll come back to how we do that Thursday. For now, I just need to know if you're willing to give the experiment a try. Okay? Okay. Your pods will have to learn to work together and to support one another. That means slowing down to build relationships, setting up your own means of communication, and finding ways to loop in people who can't be present. Group work is a lot. Nearly all of my students have said that my courses are the only ones they don't hate doing group work in. That's because your pods are not incidental to this course. They are the foundation that makes everything we do possible. Remember, this is an opportunity to be the very best to each other we can. This is the biggest learning objective for this course. Thank you for joining me on this journey. A few years ago, so I read a book by an artist and writer that I admire named Trin T. Minha. It's titled Elsewhere Within Here. And in Minha's formulation, elsewhere within here means dislocation and displacement. It connotes feeling out of place or othered in a place that's supposed to be home. But for me, when I hear elsewhere within here, the term evokes something different. It evokes a prefigurative politics. And I mean prefiguration in the way that it's been theorized by some anarchist scholars and understood as an experimental construction of new communal and social relations within our current world. So in other words, the practice of creating new social relations within oppressive systems and societies. And it's not new, you all know this as educators, to think of the classroom as a potential site of prefiguration, a site of experimentation where new communal and social relations can be created and practiced. And I think Laura is inviting her students into abolitionist prefiguration by creating pods, by acknowledging the fact that we're all vulnerable right now, but not in the same ways by centering mutual aid, by holding the value that trusting and deeply caring relationships are the foundation of safer communities. So long story short or longer, I hope that all of this makes clear why we need to be talking about and doing abolition work now and always. Because whether it's in education or in any other particular institution or space you're in, 
doing liberatory work is always on time, always on time. So I just wanted to share that because I do think that sometimes we get caught up in the abstraction of things when in fact abolition work and practice, practice and praxis is so concrete. It's the doing of many things over and over again, all with a, a set of values that guide us and that hold us as we do that work. And I just think that Laura's admonition to her young folks that she's working with can be applied to your setting as you talk with your students about the prefigurative work that's necessary in this current moment for us to be able to survive this current moment together. So thank you. I'll be shorter for the next the next part. But I do think we need to open with forcing people to think about things, drilling down to your local experiences, and then moving up and being much more broad thinking and zooming out from that local. No need to be shorter. Um, this is Erica again, and I'm moving to question two. And in many ways, um, Sort of Lisa's comments, Miriam's comments, Edgar's comments, um, Chrissy's comments have already sort of led us into this question. Um, but the question is about the tensions around institutionalization or working within an institution or a structure or a system. Um, abolitionist has work, work has always had a public or pedagogical component. Um, it's always been about creating opportunities to learn and unlearn, for example, about safety, I think our defund uh, 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 police movement has really been um, instrumental in kind of creating new opportunities for people to rethink safety. Um, but this toolkit, our fabulous toolkit, is geared towards people working or connected to, in some way, um, pre-K-12 teaching and learning contexts. And I think for us on the editorial team, we had many, 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 many questions about what it meant to bring some of this work into these contexts. So could you all talk a little, um, what does it mean when we bring uh, and we think abolition and education together? Um, and when I'm talking about education here, I'm talking about these structures and systems. Um, um, what does it, um, what does, what, what does it bring into scrutiny? What tensions emerge and also what possibilities? And so uh, we're gonna start with Lisa, then Miriam, Edgar and Chrissy. Hello, this is Lisa speaking again. Um, to answer the question, what this brings under scrutiny for me is the fact that school is a carceral project. And as somebody highlighted in the question and answer box, um, school is separate from education, right? So school as the project of being in a building, in classrooms, you know, in the traditional view of how school is done. School is a carceral project. Schools look like prisons. They are often built by the same people who build prisons. Um, and as we know by the school to prison nexus, right, it often feeds directly um, into prisons and that's not accidental. It's very much on purpose. And so as a classroom teacher, something that I'm always contemplating is what there's so many things in schools that are under the guise of safety, right? Safety for students, but actually translate into control for students. And there was a lovely piece of art in the toolkit that I feel like really um, beautifully highlighted that, right? Which is like thinking about what in my practice is for the safety, is, has been said is for the safety of students, but it's actually for the control of students. And um, there were, I think, a few essays in the toolkit about classroom management and how I've been teaching now for 11 years. And so when I, I wrote my thesis way back in the day about classroom management, because I was so fascinated with the idea of trying to create a classroom where harm didn't happen. I had some kind of fairy tale that if I did all the right things as a teacher, that my students wouldn't commit harm against each other. And I would be a good teacher if students, um, you know, never had issues with each other. They didn't fight in my classroom and I had good control over them. I had good classroom management. But what that really meant was that I got very, very good at controlling kids' bodies. And I got very, very good at um, 
controlling their movements and both through the environment and through my action. Um, and I was, I, you know, just controlling what kids did. And I was praised for this as a teacher early in my career because my classroom was so orderly, my classroom was so neat, um, and kids were quote unquote safe in my classroom. But it's taking a lot of unlearning still, still, still to this day about where that really was the dehumanizing of my students and where that was really um, me just exercising my authority and my power and my um, position of control of power over them instead of letting them have autonomy. And when everyone has autonomy, that does mean that if we're me trying to get our different wants and needs met, that there's gonna be conflict with each other and we are gonna have harm. And so what I've been really bringing to my classroom this year is thinking about instead of trying to create a perfect environment where harm doesn't happen, how can I create an environment where harm is addressed? Where how can I create an environment in which when harm occurs, we have systems and mechanisms in order to repair that harm with one another? And so starting the year, that's meant a lot of circles. Um, every Monday or every start of the week, we're having community circles to build that community, to build that trust. And that will soon translate into space where hopefully, I hope, the kids will start to feel safe enough to repair harm. And I teach ninth graders, so high schoolers, and I just um, this week floated the idea, like, what do y'all know about restorative and transformative justice? And they were like, oh, it doesn't work. Like, there's problems. It's There's two problems that are too big for that. It doesn't work. And so... Um, I know, you know, in Oakland, there's a lot of schools that have restorative practice and restorative justice programs. And so kids have experience of one version of it. Um, and so I'm excited to continue to work with the students to think about, well, if it didn't work, that means the harm wasn't repaired. And how can we actually repair the harm with one another and put in the work that that actually takes? Um, so I hope that answers the question about what, it, what comes under scrutiny, but it's just basically trying to continue to examine my practice and think about how can I bring anti-carceral logic into my teaching, even when I'm in an oppressive institution that perpetuates oppression. Love that realness, Lisa. So appreciate it. Uh, Miriam? Yeah, thanks. It appears that the chat might be disabled for y'all um, who are panelists who are participants. So maybe just use the Q&A box instead of the raised hand function, just so you can get your questions addressed or concerns addressed. Thanks. Um, yeah, this is Miriam speaking. You know, I mean, I have no idea. <laughs> what the bottom line? <laughs> I don't know. I think that we're all doing our very best and it's all about trial and error. Um, and, I'll, and I will be much briefer here, um, but Laura, uh, quoted uh, Dr. Ruth Wilson Gilmore in her post. And Ruthie suggests all the time that abolition is about the evolution of consciousness um, and that it's a self-perpetuating and always expanding curriculum. And I really like that. I like those ideas of an evolution of consciousness. And I love the idea of a self-perpetuating uh, and always expanding curriculum. Um, and that's probably just, you know, cause I'm a teacher and an educator and I, like the idea of curriculum and building curriculum and what we can do with that. Um, so I think there's, you know, Ruthie's one of the best educators I know. So taking what she says seriously, I guess, for me means that abolition demands less of a focus on kind of having the right answer and more of a focus on generative questions. And I think that you can easily bring that into any setting, but you can definitely bring that into a classroom setting. Um, what do we need education to be to allow for the formulation of better questions? Better questions amongst the students, better questions with your colleagues, better questions from your administrators, better questions from you to them. Because I think that, that those, that's going to make some shifts and transformation possibilities uh, available possibly in the spaces that people aren't thinking about when they come in already with their positions set, you know, uh, ready for battle all the time. Um, I think we need to formulate better questions. Um, 
The wonderful writer and organizer, Harsha Walia, asks a generative, generative question that really is foundational to my abolitionist praxis. And Harsha asked years ago, <laughs> like the basic question that I think we all need to be asking as organizers who are doing abolitionist organizing, which is, is what we're doing increasing the possibility of freedom? Is what we're doing increasing the possibility of freedom? I'd add for everyone. So you can apply this to an educational context. Is what we're doing in education increasing the possibility of freedom for everyone? If not, then it's probably not, it's definitely not abolitionist. And maybe we need to be working and striving to make it so. So I think like in a broad sense, you could use like a guiding question. You know, you could, you could push people to create generative questions. You could use a guiding question for yourself about is what you're doing in education increasing the possibility of freedom for everyone? Use that as a compass and kind of work from there. And the last thing I'll say is years ago, many years ago now, I was facilitating a workshop about criminalization of black people for high schoolers. And the jumping off point was to read something I had found in, um, in a newspaper that I found really useful and generative. And they were the words of this prisoner, a black prisoner whose name was actually Robert Black. And he was the negotiator to end a uh, jail uprising at the tombs in New York in like 1970, sometime October, I think, of 1970. And so Robert Black is in dialogue. I'm, I'm gonna call it dialogue loosely with a reporter. And the reporter says a question, what is your name? And Robert Black says, I'm a revolutionary. And then they ask another question, what are you charged with? And Robert Black says, I was born black. And then the reporter finally says, well, how long have you been in? And Robert Black says, I've had troubles since the day I was born. And I have over the years used that very small one, two, three, four, five, what, six lines, three questions each to fashion lessons that are simply based on the exchange. Like what generative questions might students that you're working with come up with craft from this exchange? Right? Like, what does Black mean, Robert Black mean, when he says that he's a revolutionary? What is a revolutionary? What does he mean when he responds to the question, what are you charged with, by saying he was born Black? How is Blackness criminalized in the U.S., you know? What does it mean that he's had trouble since the day he was born? What might those troubles be? What might your students be thinking about that? What questions would your students ask him in relation to the questions that he answered in the way that he did? Like, I'm just using that up as a very small example of the way that you can use anything to create a space in the classroom that's abolitious. And you can do that at any age. You can do that. Um, you know, in kindergarten. So abolition and abolition and education basically for me equals generative questions in the service of freedom making. And so that can absolutely be encouraged and fostered starting in the kindergarten. I think that's what I'll say. Love that. Love the compass. Love the generative questions. Edgar? Uh, hello, y'all. Edgar speaking again. Uh, I guess that's for myself as I'm hearing everyone else speak and just thinking about it, I was thinking of curiosity. I was thinking of that just as a, as a kid, just being able to play around, just be able to figure out things on my own or just not really having much and having to make the best out of that and out of that situation with my cousins, my nieces, my nephews, and just my brothers and sisters. Uh, but it's stoking that curiosity within each and every one of us to question things, to question some of the stuff that's being taught in, in our schools, uh, to bring up topics that we experience within our communities freely without being ashamed. You know, sometimes uh, growing up as a Chicano, indigenous Chicano man, you know, we we're always taught, you don't say those things at school. They might take you away, you know? And uh, well, what, is, what does it mean to actually be able to come back and, and, and talk about these things that we might be all confronting in school? Uh, be able to challenge some of those things. I, and I still remember clearly uh, fourth grade having to <laughs> do build a mission and and having to build a mission and talk about it, or even going to Santa Cruz mission and, and make some adobe clays. Like little did I know, it's like, I was doing some of the forced work that some of the relatives 
here locally were, were forced to do it. And, and they also died in the same place. But really having that, curio that curiosity to ask questions, but also um, the ability to have, to stoke our creativity and our imagination to think beyond well, what's already in place and what can be possible uh, within our house, within the education, because we focus within the school setting, but also thinking about of, of the home. How can that be run parallel when we're talking about abolitionist work? How can we bring these teachings uh, back to my grandma so my grandma can understand my grandfather, my uncles and aunties, my mom? Uh, how can and so it can always run parallel to what's happening within the education setting? But also, also it also means to me having being vulnerable and having courage, you know, the vulnerability to like, hey, regardless, again, it's like, I might ask a quote unquote, the wrong question or a dumb question, but also just being vulnerable to, to, to just ask that, even explore some of the stuff that's happening within their community and being able to find solutions, you know, so always having the courage to step up, um, which I believe is really important. And, and it's, you know, what it also means is being able to, for me, and just coming from around my experiences it's, and, cultural awareness and awakening, which really set me up, you know, and uh, I came along, I came across a lot of these terms while I was incarcerated and within, and within a, a place where I was told I was never going to get out, you know, I would probably do life and all that stuff and, and from folk teachers, educators and all that, but I came across, you know, my cultural identity. I came across uh, spiritual leaders and uncles there that taught me about their ways and encouraged me to Look out, look out for my ways, my history, my heritage, my story, to ask my grandmother, my mom, where we come from. And having that opportunity to really dive deep into where I came from and what I represented, and but also pave a path that looked different, you know, for myself, that would that look different from my mother's or my father's. Uh, but it's that that's really an opportunity for my that's how I look at abolition within the education system. And but also thinking of like. When I was incarcerated as a kid, I spent my whole high school years locked up. And in the, the education I received while incarcerated, it was a booklet. It was like, here, take this pack. No opportunity to really stoke any type of uh, creativity or imagination or anything like that. So just thinking of like, what can, what can be done there? Reach some of those young people who are the leaders in their communities. Some of those folks that people are look up to, how do we reach them, uh, reach out to them and, and, and stoke their curiosity have them pose those questions, you know, have them come up with those solutions that I believe their answers are all there. Some of the smartest, most uh, brightest artistic folks that I've met are in there. And uh, just really thinking of, again, our curiosity, the, the opportunity to be vulnerable and courageous and, and challenge some of these education settings. And, and I think we do it every single day. Some of the times these young kids ask, always constantly asking us or asking me, my nieces and nephews, like, what is that and why, why? Why, why, why? They're always asking me why. And it's like, and sometimes I don't have the answers. It's like, can you help me out? You know, and for me, just being a little bit older, it's just like, it's okay. Like we can probably figure this out together, but just being vulnerable and open and to just exploring those solutions with them. And, and just even just the conversation is beautiful at times, you know, with my grandma to my four-year-old niece or nephew, it's it's a beautiful thing. And uh, and I think if we can be able to achieve that within the school setting, then, then it's beautiful. Uh, there's always going to be barriers and we're going to see that through a lot of the policies and legislation, but it's like, Hey, we got to continue to do what we do, you know, from the streets all the way to the school system and, and to the prisons. And, and by all means, regardless of if our book is banned in the prison, if, if when we have another teacher telling on this, it's like, you got to be uh, courageous, you know, in order to have those conversations, but vulnerable, vulnerable enough to, to call, to sit, sit in that space of discomfort and fight for what you think is right for those young people, for our collective freedom and our overall well-being of our communities. I'll just say that much, y'all. Palabra. Thank you, Edgar. Super powerful and, and just incredibly useful. Chrissy? Yes, I, you know, first just really want to um, appreciate all the panelists and appreciate all the wisdom. Um, so when, when I was thinking about this question about um, when prison industrial complex abolition is brought to education and specifically schooling, um, I think it brings a lot of things under scrutiny. Um, one that comes to mind is the logics and practices of disposability um, or the production of, as Carla Shalaby would say, throwaway people. Um, 
I think it forces us to consider how these logics and practices are reflected across institutions, um, including prisons, healthcare, and of course, schools. So for me, scrutinizing disposability um, raises so much about how young people are sorted, about punitive policies and practices that pervade our schools, about anti-Blackness and racism in our schools and communities, um, and also raises those tensions that we've really grappled with that's inherent of bringing those kind of abolitionist practices into school spaces, as has been um, talked about by other panelists. Um, and this entrenchment of disposability in schools uh, through an abolitionist lens makes me also come back to this question of education to what ends, um, for what project. And I really love the question um, that Miriam raised, um, uh, quoting Harsha Walia, right, around the possibilities of freedom and increasing the possibilities of freedom. Um, and for me, abolition also forces us to ask questions about how these freedom dreams um, get institutionalized and pacified to the point that the projects of liberation are unrecognizable. Um, so in some of the uh, attendees for today, um, when we talked about fears, um, you know, some folks talked about that abolition will just become another DEI, it'll just uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, it'll just become another diversity training. Um, and I think that, you know, what abolition really challenges us to do is to think about um, is to, to move past that kind of one-off model um, that is so present in a lot of our schools and a lot of our you know, different educational spaces that we're in um, and ask some of these questions around how do we act in solidarity with communities, with our students, and how do we build um, real community in our classrooms and our schools, which I think our other panelists have spoken really beautifully to. Um, and you know, to, this, to this end, I think it's that fear of simply putting the word abolition where the word diversity was before. You know, I think too about, you know, there are some cases that I've heard about where schools have put the word, um, uh, you know, they've put restorative justice in the place of discipline on their policy and they didn't change anything inside of it, right? We kind of probably all have kind of stories like that. So, um, you know, I think a lot about how kind of moving past that is about making meaningful connections and being invested in the liberation of our communities and um, of our young people, of all people. Um, and so part of that is needing to ask, how can we break down this idea um, that teachers are not part of the communities that we're teaching in or that you're teaching in? Um, teachers are part of the communities that we're teaching in. The question is, what kind of presence are we, right? Or what kind of presence are you? Um, and so the other kind of question it brings up under scrutiny for me is those questions around accountability. And I think in education, the word accountability has become this dirty word because it's been weaponized against young people. It's been weaponized against educators. Um, but taking as a guide the work coming out of disability justice and transformative justice, um, one of the questions that PIC abolition and education spaces raises is questions about how we can normalize accountability to one another as educators, um, to families, to students, and to communities. So those are some of the, um, some of the many pieces that abolition um, brings under scrutiny for me. Thank you so much uh, to our panelists. I'm gonna, I'm just looking at time y'all and time has went by so quickly. And so because of that, I'm gonna ask our panelists to join us in a lightning round. We gonna go super fast. So you have about two minutes or less um, to think about one of these questions. So, you know, many organizations and people, including some of the folks on this panel, remind us that abolition is a long-term vision, right? But it's also a current daily practice. So you can either share with us what is like one teaching or learning practice that you are currently um, collectively engaged uh, with that you think might be of interest to educators, or um, if you have any advice that you wanna give to educators that are grappling with this work, how to build with this work, how to engage this toolkit, um, so either of those questions, if you could do it in two minutes or less, we would really appreciate you because we want to honor folks' time. Um, so we will go in the following order. We're going to ask Miriam to kick us off, and then we'll go back to Edgar. And then from Edgar, we'll go to Chrissy and then to Lisa. So Miriam. Sure. I don't have any advice. I'll just say that I continue to practice uh, zine making. 
and have um, several uh, works, collective works in the process or in the hopper. Most of them are collaborations with others. And I think educators should engage students into making their own publications more. I always find that to be a space where it allows young people to use their creativity to, you know, to dream a little, to think a little, to work with other people. So yeah, yay to zine making as abolitionist praxis. <laughs> I'll say that, thanks. Hey, uh, Ed, that speaking again, and I think for myself is the power of storytelling. Uh, storytelling is key, y'all, uh, and, and I think it. Uh, everybody comes with their own story and being able to allow and, and encourage young people to share their stories without no shame, allow them to dive deep into that, to that vulnerability, but also courage is, is super important. And, um, and, and, but also allowing them to really explore the, the possibility of, of what, again, the imagination to see beyond their own reality that, that, that they might live in, you know, provide a little bit of hope but also, again, encouraging that story, and that story can be done in many different, uh, be shared in many different ways. Uh, and, and again, story writing, music, uh, again, it, and I just can't share it. On just in the story time is is a, is a big one. But uh, I'll say that much, y'all. Palabra. Great. Um... So I will just add, I'm debating between the two, but I think that I will, um, you know, one of the things that um, Erica says a lot, right, is that this is long, long haul work, um, right? That this is, this is not kind of just right now, but it's, we're working towards the long haul. So I think the advice would be find your people. I think that's been one of the more powerful things um, that um, I've learned in this project and, you know, find also folks that are going to work with you to nurture those affirmative visions that, um, that I was talking about. This is Lisa here again. Um, I wanna go to the advice question. And so some advice I would give um, to educators in this abolitionist work is to as often as you can engage in internal reflection around the following question. And so the first is, how can you bring your full humanity to this work while also honoring the full humanity of your students? I find that a lot of educators are people like me who are really good at intellectualizing in order to avoid emotions and feelings. We get really far along in school by doing that in the project of school. Um, and so it can be really easy for educators to sometimes avoid emotions and avoid feelings, both their own and teach students how to do that, right? Just leave that at the door. We have to do work now. Just forget that we have to focus on this. Um, and so in that, another question is where are you avoiding vulnerability as an educator? Um, because when we seek perfection, when we seek for the perfect lesson, the perfect routine, the perfect curriculum, right? We're trying to avoid, sometimes we're trying to avoid vulnerability um, and scary, messy moments. And I'm really good at also avoiding all of that. And so just doing the internal reflection daily, if you can, weekly, monthly, but where are you, um, how can you bring your full humanity and honor the full humanity of your students while being vulnerable? Thank you so much, Lisa, Edgar, Miriam, and Chrissy. So many beautiful words of wisdom um, this evening. Really what I'm hearing y'all say is how can we be more human, right? How do we kind of be much more in touch with our humanity, with our stories, with our essence and, and make that accessible, right? So thank you so much. Um, what I wanna do in this moment is give y'all a little toolkit teaser. Um, and I'm gonna ask uh, Chrissy Hernandez to please um, support us in teasing folks this evening. All right, thank you, Farima. Um, so I'm gonna read the closing piece of the toolkit um, called Celebrate Fire, Celebrate Seed. So in June, 2020, our editorial collective organized a series of webinars to offer a space to think together abolition and education within the context of the pandemic and uprisings against the state-sponsored murder of black peoples. We were astonished by the response, 
with over 10,000 people registering in less than one week. Those who registered identified as pre-K-12 teachers, music teachers, farm-based educators, unschoolers, homeschoolers, arts integrationists, social workers, librarians, principals, formerly incarcerated people, disability rights activists, immigrant rights activists, special education educators, students, and many others. Attendees registered from across the United States and from over 20 countries around the world. The variety and reach of attendees reminds us that abolition must be and is viewed through an internationalist framework. Abolition is urgent and demands that we organize and connect across all borders. We asked for attendees to write what they hope to get out of the webinar. These responses range from needing to more deeply engage while noting that sprinkling social justice in the curriculum was not working to activist teachers seeking co-conspirators. Many wrote about fire, a fire within, wanting to burn the system down, needing a spark, feeling burnt out, and feeling a light dim, not to mention love for the fire, fire panelists. We honor that the fire so many wrote about, celebrated, mourned, and longed for is a fire nourished by Black and Indigenous liberation struggles across the globe. To honor the voices of the thousands who gathered virtually to dream abolition into education that day, and to honor you on your journey, we have written a poem composed from lines drawn from the 10,214 responses. We humbly offer it as a collective meditation, a love offering on education for liberation. Celebrate fire, celebrate seed. How do we expel the carceral where nothing is enough? Not our burnout, not layoffs, not zero tolerance, not capitalist cultures created to crush us, not cages. Colonial slavery punishment roots that grow concrete, police murder, compliance classrooms. We can't go back, can't stay here. We need revolution, an orchestra of fire renewed, a sense of purpose, spirit, a stepping stone. How do we center children? How do we fight alongside our most impacted, our incarcerated? How do we honor our communities, all intersections, all borderlands in an upheaval society that takes and takes? How do we move into the fight against the script this country writes? Truth-telling? We want a space to unpack, name, and dismantle good intentions. White saviorism, anti-Black state violence, hiding in silence, hiding in privilege. We ask, how do we love radically? Beloveds, let us lead courageous, compassionate lives. Grasp an us bigger than who look like you. Let us journey together to bars of knowledge, a music of critical hope, a rupture, a North Star, a lit match, not bars of death and white fragility. Journey a chorus, a portal, a history made we make it for what is right. A heritage of liberation, write a script that resists script making, burn that which does not nourish, create home place, a path, a new ground. There we listen, all work, all rest aligned to liberation. We listen libraries, we build, heal, you can name it, radical, purpose, solidaridad, abolition, seed, fuel for fire burning, for fire waiting, teach horizons, presence, light a dreamscape, reignite our interconnected hearts. Thank you so much, Chrissy, for sharing um, that piece of the toolkit with us. And 
what we want to do is I'm going to ask folks to just reflect for a moment. Um, and we, because we're out of time, I'm going to pass it to Erica so she can close us out. But I would love for y'all to just take a moment and maybe share one takeaway uh, from this evening's conversation in this community Padlet. Um, you can hover over the QR code and it will take you to the Padlet. Otherwise, tech will share it in the chat. Just one takeaway that you wanna hold close from this conversation. And as you are doing that, I'm gonna go ahead and pass it over to my sis, Erica. We are just so grateful, um, you know, so humbled. I really appreciated Edgar's movement humility for um, all the folks that have joined us tonight. I know many of us are coming from a long day of work. Some of us still have work ahead of us. Um, and many of us are participating in care and movement work. Um, so just appreciative of the community that has gathered this evening and has supported this project over the years. Um, so we wanna thank all the contributors. Many of them are on the call tonight um, um, in the Lessons of Liberation and particularly our four amazing and brilliant panelists tonight, Chrissy and Lisa and Miriam and Edgar. Um, and we also just wanna acknowledge all the support from the Education for Liberation Network and Critical Resistance and the many other organizations and networks um, and comrades that made this conversation possible, as well as those who are holding up the webinars yet to come. Um, we're gonna have some thematic ones that are gonna be um, diving into the toolkit and really lifting up some of the resources um, for conversation. Um, we wanna um, we want to just acknowledge Chrissy for all the um, care and labor as our managing editor and, and, and excellent humor. Um, Shiva Sabata, Sabati, um, for their amazing support, holding down accessibility and so much more, and also um, just kindness and smarts. Um, Molly Porzig um, and Viju Matthew for holding down tech tonight. Um, so amazing. Our ASL interpreters tonight, Joe, Cookie, Sean, and Juan. Um, Sally from the AI media team for providing CART, C-A-R-T, captions tonight. Um, Corey, uh, Corey Green from HALA from the, for the opening poem, and also just the wider Lessons in Liberation editorial collective that please join us for the upcoming webinars. You'll get to meet the rest of the editorial collective over the next few webinars. Um, and also just deep gratitude to AK Press for their um, care and support with this really beautiful um, project. Um, um, if you want to rewind, rewatch, or share today's panel, um, it's going to be available on the YouTube and Facebook pages of Critical Resistance and the Free Minds, Free People site of the Education for Liberation Network. Um, with that, um, we are going to close uh, a minute ahead of schedule and um, just sending love and care to the community and looking forward to um, the shared work that is gonna to continue to erupt and emerge over um, the days and weeks and years to come, the long haul. Thank you. Peace to all, be free. You now tune in to WRBD, Soul Development Radio. You already know, I'm the legendary DJ Real Talk and this next joint is called Sweet Freedom. Could I choose to be silent and say I care about it? I raise my voice to raise awareness till they hear about it. Until they speak about it, read about it, be about it. And do they part to get my people about them cocoa farms? If you say silent, then you only choose to do more harm. I'm speaking words of freedom in the lines of every song. My people need them, we won't stop till ain't no slaves at all. Cause if I'm free and you ain't free, then we ain't free at all. You gotta evolve and get involved. I am my brother's keeper. And greedy companies exploit the kids because it's cheaper. I challenge every artist. Us with a voice to choose to speak up. If we unite, we manifest anything that we speak of. With the sweet, it's so much bigger than you and me. So much better when we're free. When we come together, freedom never tastes so good. Sweet taste of freedom, freedom never tastes so good. Sweet taste of freedom. Yo.
to all be free. You are now tuned in to WRBD Soul Development Radio. You already know. I'm the legendary DJ Real Talk, and this next joint is called could I choose to be silent and say I care about it? I raise my voice to raise awareness till they hear about it. Until they speak about it, read about it, be about it. And do they part to get my people about them cocoa farms? If you say silent, then you only choose to do more harm. I'm speaking words of freedom in the lines of every song. My people need them, we won't stop till ain't no slaves at all. Cause if I'm free and you ain't free, then we ain't free at all. You gotta evolve and get involved, I am my brother's keeper. And greedy companies exploit the kids because it's cheaper. I challenge every artist. With a voice to choose to speak up If we unite we manifest anything that we speak of It's bitter with the sweet It's so much bigger than you and me So much better when we're free When we come together Freedom never tastes so good The sweet taste of freedom Freedom never tastes so good the sweet taste of freedom Yo there's a war going on outside and it ain't safe But it's hard to keep the faith when the pistol is in your face And the finger on the trigger that just might control your fate First they shot us while we marched, then they bombed us while we prayed Stole our bodies and beat our bodies to be somebody's slave Made a killing off of the living that forced us in the grave Fast forward the day Niggas ain't scared to die Some of us will escape and others too scared to try Many of us will weep and others too hurt to cry If you gangster about your freedom, now's the time to mobilize Libya to India and every prison bump between If they ain't free, then you ain't free Don't let them sell you no false dreams Take the bitter with the sweet It's so much bigger than you and me So much better when we're free When we come together Freedom never tastes so social problem to which you can be a change agent and walk away from that opportunity and I know that that fight isn't separate from the fight we fight here in the states every day we're talking about educating children to give them access to opportunities something that I stand by and do every day but how do I not then have the ability to not just see my students or the young folks in my community but the young folks home in the motherland, continental Africa. I couldn't imagine not taking responsibility. I couldn't imagine not taking an invitation to be a part of a social change. Peace, yo, what up? It's Kariga Bailey of Soul Development checking in. Thanks for checking out our content. Um, check out the link in the bio. Engage with us as we disrupt hopelessness. Remember, you can be part of the solution, a part of the crowd that watches it pass by. Peace.